Ladies and gentlemen, Kat Bleich, formerly Kat Bleich, now Kat Benandon, congratulations on your recent wedding. It was such a beautiful thing to get to participate in, uh, as we did online. I am going to have a hard time forever calling you anything other than Kat Bleich because I've known you for so long. I mean, there, there, it is, it, 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 God damn you for being such a good old friend. You make me feel old introducing you <laughs> because Kat and I, Kat and I go back to the, the early days, the early days of the Ron Paul movement. And, and I think we can say Ron Paul brought us together, at least in, in an indirect way, but by inspiring both of us to activism um, or at least to, to communi communicating and, and being a part of the, the bigger community around the Ron Paul 2008 campaign. Um, at the time, uh, of course, I was doing a rock veterans against the war and Kat was working on fusion centers. And uh, there was just so, so I, I mean, I, there were so many other projects that you took on during that, that time. Um, I, I, if you could, I mean, give, could you give us that, that your, at least your, your resume as, as an activist going back to, you know, 2007, was it? I think you got started. Okay, sure. So for the proper pronunciation, it's Bonandine. My husband is Italian. So, um, yeah. And Bleich was hard enough for everyone, even though it's one syllable. But Bonandine, it's Italian. So 2007, I got involved with the Ron Paul campaign. Hold on, Kat, Kat. Everybody knows that if a name is pronounced Bonandine in, in Italian... Banandin is the proper American <laughs> pronunciation. I'm not going to stand for that. <laughs> oh, so, yeah, it went from one complicated name to another hard to pronounce <laughs> name, but that's okay. I don't mind. Um, I'm still working on learning Italian. I have to pass an Italian test to become a dual citizen. So it's uh, kind of terrifying. Because <laughs> I've only grown up learning Spanish, you know, my whole life because we touch Mexico. So of course that was the natural language to learn, but now I'm working on a third. So well, okay. and then before, before we get to your resume, let me, let me ask to get dual citizenship with Italy. There's, there's a practical reason for this, but why not just like go to Barbados and buy a second passport? Like it ha has to be Italy. Is Italy like one of these hard ones? They actually make you speak the language and like know stuff about their country. Yeah, I got to speak the language. So, you know, uh, we plan to move there probably in the next decade. And I need to be able to speak the language. So I'm going to work on it. I've been trying. I've got like three different learning apps. And of course, he's starting to think in English and doesn't speak in Italian very much. But I'm like, will you at least please speak to the pets in Italian? <laughs> so that way, that way I can, you know, have some access to it. Um, but it, everyone says it's similar to Spanish, and it kind of is, but really it's not. I mean, really, it's it's a whole new thing. So yeah, I gotta I gotta make that happen. But the cool thing is, my kids get to become dual citizens, and any future children that we have get to become dual citizens. So kind of a neat thing. I went from the whole undocumented world to now I'm like, how many Super passports can I get? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, hold on, no, no, cat. I'm gonna. I mean, I just saw a, a news report about, and, and they're using Corona as the excuse, or I, I like to call it the Karen virus, but because of Corona, the U.S. passport will only get you in a handful of countries now. They turn you away. They know you're an American. You've probably, you're probably sick and diseased. We're not going to take you. And, and Italy, holy crap, Italy's got to be worse for that, right? Like, <laughs> if you want a passport for freedom, I mean, aren't they like, Aren't there guys selling you passports to like Lieberland or Botswana or I, I don't know, like the, it, Cayman Islands, some, something <laughs> like that where you actually get more free. I mean, all you get to do is go from one heavily statist territory suffering from coronaphobia to another one. <laughs> well, hopefully this corona stuff won't last forever. I've got long game in mind. But we'll see. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Either way, 
I'm not going to limit myself by not getting a passport <laughs> I'm entitled to because I married an Italian citizen. So I'm going to go for it. And then we'll see how many more I can add on. I mean, maybe the next time I come on, I'll be working on my Cayman Island passport. I don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> but all I'm right, all so, about so, it. So, how many how many paperwork can I get so I can travel as freely as possible? That's that's my goal right now. I just want to get a world passport to work or my I'm gonna print my own passports for a gardenia. But we'll come back to that. Go back, <laughs> go, back go back, go back, go back. 2007, 2008. Give us give us your origin story, please. Okay, so I was actually an anti-Bush, anti-war activist, and in 2006. I was interning at the National Association of Insurance Commissioners and the guy who sat in the cubicle behind me, he told me, you are not a liberal, you're a libertarian. And I said, no, 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 I'm a liberal. I don't like Bush, I'm anti-Republican. I, I am not a libertarian, I am a liberal for sure. I am a liberal and he said, no, you're not, watch this speech. And he sent me a Ron Paul anti-war speech and like my, my jaw is on the table, right? And then my whole world opened up and I realized this is why my liberal friends don't agree with me on almost everything I talk about other than being anti-Bush. And so I began this journey of getting involved with the Ron Paul campaign. Uh, 2007, I started a Ron Paul meetup group in Santa Barbara, California. And then I moved back home to Kansas City, started one there, came really, really involved. Very long story short, I became a delegate first to the county convention, then the state convention, and then the national convention. I was very involved with helping to train other delegates, very, very, very involved. And when I was there at the Republican National Convention, I had the most heartbreaking experience in the world. I realized I was nothing more than an extra on a TV set. And mm -hmm. that began this journey of trying to figure out where do I belong? What is my activism? You know, And, and this is how I was introduced to you with Iraq Veterans Against the War and your activism with the RNC and all these different things. And so I started getting involved with states' rights, and that was how I was introduced to the MIAC report, which was released by a Fusion Center at the time, and it was profiling people who supported Ron Paul, Chuck Baldwin, the Constitution Party, Bob Barr, Libertarian Party, people who didn't believe in the Federal Reserve banking system, people who believed in sound money. It even mentioned the documentary American Freedom to Fascism by name. And yep. this profiled us as potentially radical, violent militia members. And mm -hmm. this came out of my state in Missouri. And I was so unhappy about this report that I went all in just completely all in. And I lobbied the state legislature. I gave a copy of America Freedom to Fascism to literally every single state representative and every single state senator, the attorney general, the governor, everybody. And I was at the Porcupine Freedom Festival in 2010. I was giving a rant in their well-known soapbox idol competition. And yep. On stage, I had the realization that I was an anarchist. Like it came to me while I was ranting. <laughs> and so at the very end of can I can I swear on your thing? Because I can say what sure. I said. Okay. So at the very end of my rant, I'm like complaining about the centralization. The Ron Paul movement got centralized. Everyone's getting centralized. We need to stay decentralized. We need to stay grassroots. Blah, 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 blah. And then I'm like, I'm a motherfucking anarchist. <laughs> and the, you know, the whole room blew up. And so that kind of began my journey into individual sovereignty and community building and just really learning how to function as an autonomous human being, how to reclaim authority over my own life. And that led me into the Sovereign Living Project and eventually to the Homestead Guru and into yoga and all of these different things that I'm into now. So that's my very short resume. <laughs> well, as, as long as you bring up the A word, and I, I understand that that was a, a seminal moment in your awakening. I think a lot of libertarians go through that. And, I, you know, I myself uh, formerly identified as an anarcho-capitalist. And I, I think at least that kind of makes it more specific. But what it, how, how did Murray Rothbard come up with that term? I think he took the two most offensive words to describe what he was talking <laughs> about. Most confusing 
and, and guaranteed to piss off everyone and put them together into one term uh, that there was a total disaster uh, of messaging. And so a lot of libertarians who feel like, ah, I've gotten to the bottom of the rabbit hole, therefore I'm anarchist. What, what, and correct me if I'm wrong, but we're, we're using, I want, we use the term anarchist in, in a political context to mean something very specific that I think is better described as voluntarist. Is that, is that fair to describe what, 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 how you would think of yourself now? Yes, I'm a philosophical anarchist. I believe in voluntary community. I don't believe that anyone should be forced or coerced into any relationship whatsoever. That extends to children. That extends to, you know, everyone in our community. So yes, voluntarist is probably a really good definition that I could, if I had to pick a banner, I might pick yeah. that. But I will say, Adam, <laughs> my dog is named Murray Roth Bark. So... <laughs> <laughs> oh, beautiful. To give you any indication to how all in I was at the time. <laughs> so I, I, I want to go back for a second to uh, to the Mayak report and, and the fusion centers, because I feel like and, and I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but in, in terms of you developing your worldview and understanding of government and, I, I, you know, creating a sense of identity for yourself as an activist. That really was the critical experience for you, right? I would say so, at least one of them. I think right now I'm watching everything I was warning people about come to fruition. I was giving speeches called Understanding the Mechanics of the Police State because I went and I visited these fusion centers. And for those in your audience who don't know what they are, they're multi-jurisdictional information gathering and intelligence creating apparatuses and they are funded through department of homeland security grant money and they exist in every single state in the union and they were created out of the 9-11 commissions act of oh gosh it's been a while since i've gone through my fusion center history but it might have been 2005 or 2006 is when these became legally you know a functioning Thing. And <clears throat> I was traveling the country with my ex, John, and we were visiting these fusion centers and actually interviewing the people who were running them. And what we began to discover is that there was a long game plan that was being implemented by the state. And every single year, these um, databases that they were using to let to collect information were expanding. So, you know, it, it went from thumbprints to handprints to facial scans, tattoo and scar database. Um, this just continued to expand and expand and expand. And I actually attended Homeland Security Fusion Center conferences. And I went around to the vendor booths and I picked up the materials from these vendors who were selling technology to our law enforcement institutions. And I could see what was coming down the pipes, the sound cannons, the, the, just the infrared, the, the weaponry that they had developed, that they were selling to local law enforcement, to state law enforcement, to FBI. I mean, these conferences were attended by all jurisdictions of law enforcement. And I could see what was coming down the pipes and I was giving talks at conferences across the country, letting people know what was coming. And sure enough, here we are. There's martial law, civil war, violence in the streets. This is taking place and you can see the weaponry that they're using. You can see the databases that they're using. It has been instituted in full force. So pay attention because they're telling you where things are going. They're telling you what's going to happen. Their plans are not private, they're not secret. And if you're labeled as a conspiracy theorist for listening and paying attention, move on, don't fight with those people because I will tell you what, 10 years later, those people will be coming back to you saying, hey, I have all these questions, I have all these concerns. They will start to wake up, it is seeping into the mainstream you know, media, the mainstream consciousness, and it's not worth arguing with people who aren't willing to look, who aren't willing to see. Now, this isn't where my activism is anymore because I saw what was coming. And first I sounded the alarms, but then I decided I have to work on solutions because I got pregnant. And now I've got children that are almost nine and seven years old. And I've spent the last decade since I got, 
since I got pregnant, focusing on creating a solution for the next generation. I feel right, like hold I on, hold on, hold on. I, before we get to that, I'm not done talking about the problems, Kat. Let's get <laughs> right into this. Uh, yeah, there's no because what before we get into to everything that you're doing now and and you know the, the beautiful positive response in individual living and encouraging other people to live more by human values, right? I say by our values. They're not libertarian values aren't our values. It's just that we apply ethics to politics consistently. And yep. it's it's basic human values of of love and peace and, and cooperation and harmony. But be before we get to all that crap, um, no, I, I, I really, <laughs> I, want, I want to talk about, uh, I mean, it seems like some of today's conspiracy theorists are tomorrow's prophets. Mm -hmm. And from what you just said earlier about there are a lot of things that you are warning people about that are coming true now. Now, what are those and what do you see, you know, and, and, and how, how surprised are you by what we're experiencing with Corona right now? Well, I would say the biggest thing that is happening that I am not at all surprised by is the militarized police force. I mean, we have a civil war taking place and you have law enforcement who look like they are in a war zone. And that's what's happening. You know, when, when you think about images, now of course I was watching it on the media, you were there in person, Adam, but you, you have civilians fighting US military over in the Middle East, you're looking at that right here in the streets in the United States. I'm not surprised by that because I saw that coming down the pipes. Now, I also saw them preparing for medical emergencies. For example, here in Austin, I wanna say it was 2010, they were trying to pass, you know, they already can take your blood on the side of the road without your consent, the vampire cops for DUI checkpoints, but they were trying to make it so that they could institute mass prophylaxis, mass inoculation, giving everyone shots without their consent in the case of a medical emergency. So they were already trying to institute things like mandatory vaccines, even though there wasn't a crisis taking place, quote unquote crisis, mm -hmm. 10 years ago. So I'm not surprised by this. When it happened, it did surprise me because it came on so fast and so hard and uh, was of a global proportion. Mm -hmm. In my mind, I thought it would happen in the United States only. But really, when I step back and take a bird's eye view, we've been watching the whole United Nations global governance. There was no reason for me to be surprised that it happened at a global level. And also, Bill Gates, he, he took me off guard. I did not run into him in all of my research, in all the global governmental stuff with the environmental stuff and all of that, he wasn't on my radar during those activism days and how involved he has been in orchestrating this whole thing. That was kind of surprising for me that I hadn't picked up on that 10 years ago. Um, but ultimately, I, I was not surprised that it was a medical thing that came down and I was not surprised by the militarized police force that is attacking everybody. I will say this much. I had a very hard time in June when all of this was popping off. I was so triggered because I had unhealed wounding from my activist arrest. This whole Black Lives Matter, white guilt. I was very upset because twice I went to jail. I was arrested defending a Black person from a cop. And not only was I shamed by the general public, but I was shamed by the liberty movement. It was kind of split down the middle. Half of the people thought I was a hero. Half of the people thought I was a reckless hothead who was behaving in ways that I shouldn't have been. And I shoved the trauma of being kidnapped and put in a cage very, very, very deep inside. And when I got on my phone, like when you were talking about being a phone addict, I think I can say I was one until June. Um, I actually went to the hospital thinking I was having a heart attack. I could not figure out what was going on. Turns out it was a nine day long anxiety attack. And it was the trauma of these arrests that I went through in 09 and in 2010 coming out. 
coming out mm. from my body in this very, very visceral way. And it was painful and it was very triggered and it was very emotional. And I'm like, how dare you say that I'm a racist because of my skin color? I went to jail for black people. And it wasn't because they were black, it was because they were human. And you all ridiculed me. And now you're trying to shame me for the color of my skin because of how I was born. Where were you when I got put in a cage? And I was very, very triggered by it. And I'm, I'm grateful that it happened because it gave me the opportunity to heal um, that trauma, to really do the work, to dig deep. You know, I talked to my therapist about it and I got it all out. You got to feel it to heal it, you know. And yeah. um, back then in 2009 and 2010, I self-medicated with marijuana and wine. And I, you know, I had jail time hanging over my head. It was a very scary time for me. I felt very alone. I felt abandoned. Thankfully, the New Hampshire Free State community. They were there for me. They showed up to my court date. They were there. You know, I had three cops testify against me, but our movement did not have a, a support team there to help the activists who went through these traumas. And I don't know if it's because I'm a woman or because I'm a highly sensitive person, but I think I was affected by these activists related arrests and they, they, they traumatized me in a way that, you know, I don't feel like I see you having that kind of trauma when you go through an arrest like I went through. But it was very hard for me. And when all of this stuff kicked up this year, it brought it all back to the surface, which I'm grateful for, because it gave me a chance to really feel it for the first time, I think. Yeah, well, if, if I may, you know, I, I had a bit of a an epiphany experience just yesterday interviewing Richard Gage, you know, architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth. Oh, yeah. And I had to tell my audience, you know, why do I care about this 19 years later? And I, I wanted to talk to the people in my audience, the kids, because we have we have kids who watch this show. I can't uh, believe it's been 19 years, Adam. Yeah, no, and it, you know, 9-11 was 19 years ago the exact midpoint of my life right now. It's kind of a weird thing to look oh. back on. I'm 38, halfway back through my life, 9-11 happened. And the rest of my life has been somehow defined by that. And if you're, if you're 19 years old today, or even 20, you know, if you were too young to be aware of what was going on in 9-11, there's, there's a whole generation of adults and young adults right now we just have no idea the significance of 9-11 and how that led to, I mean, even your activism and the Patriot Act and 9-11 was the backdrop for all the fusion centers and the ramping up of the police state that, that you were addressing. But yesterday, uh, after spending an, an hour with Richard Gage at the end of the interview, I was like, fuck, you know, I've, I've been, I've been avoiding. There, there's a certain, like, cause, cause I'm, you know, I'm pretty good at handling the physical, you know, event trauma, the violent trauma. Like I'm, I'm trained for that. I'm conditioned. Like I can handle that. But there's something about the emotional side of the trauma that I'm like totally unprepared to deal with. And, uh, you know, even as a psych major with that background and experience in counseling, you can't always do that and have that effect for yourself. And it was, like I, I had been kind of in denial about 9-11, not, not, not in it. So not like most people, not like most people are in denial about it. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but I was, I was in denial about the emotional implications for me and my life. Like they put me through that and I watched my friends die in Iraq, not just because of a lie or one crime, but an extended, abusive, violent, deceptive relationship that I had with my government, that most Americans have with our government. And even just being able to admit that, I think, has um, helped me enjoy my wine and weed a lot more lately, let's just say for now. <laughs> um, but no, you know, we're, we're all coming out of this, cat, and I, and, and I want I want to, you know, really see if you know, your take, you said you're, you're hopeful that Corona goes away, that this Corona phobia crisis rather goes away and that you're surprised by the global nature of it. Uh, is, is there anything 
that you learn from the disparity in policies between governments around the world? Uh, and, and does that tell you anything about, you know, the future? Like, are, how are we going to learn from this or are they going to be able to do it again? Yeah, I think it's interesting how Sweden and Norway, these Norwegian countries, they don't have the mandated masks and they are doing fine. I'm also noticing here in the United States, there seems to be a really big divide around the face masks, and I believe it's woken some people up. I know for me as an unmasked person walking through the world, it's very strange being the only person in a grocery store with a bare face. That came on so suddenly, and I find it interesting how at one point here in the United States, things culturally were so anti-Muslim and anti-face coverings, and then everyone just jumped onto it really, really suddenly. And I, I found that really, really interesting. What I do believe has happened though, is technology has grown up in a way all around us that information is being spread at such a rapid rate that it is very difficult for the deceptions to continue. And I'm seeing people like my father questioning things that 10 years ago, he probably thought I was insane for speaking out against. And we've had some very heartfelt conversations about what's happening. And I believe that this can be attributed to the ease in which information can be spread. Because keep in mind, when we got started as activists, we still had flip phones. I had a Razor flip phone. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, th this, this, yeah, this, this live streaming thing, it started with Quick QIK that later got bought by Skype. And yeah. it was very novel and very grainy and not very many people would watch it. And um, I still can't believe when I look back at some of the interactions I had, like, um, with my with my flip phone with my razor, um, I had I was driving in a car with somebody who didn't have license plates, and he was getting arrested, and I was videotaping it and streaming it to Quick, and I got pulled out backward by the the police officer, and um, she took my my phone from me, and I snatched it back, and I turned it around and stuck it on her badge really fast, and said, "What is your name and badge number?" And like, when I look back on that, that was in St. Louis city. Like, how did I not get my ass beat or tased? I mean, it was incredible. White privilege. Um, <laughs> that, that, yes. And that, that's where I think it was a female white cop. You know, the arresting officer was a male black cop. He was arresting the driver of the car, um, but a female white cop, you know, we were face to face and she's like, you don't have to be so hostile. Um, but I never would have been empowered to do that if it wasn't for the live streaming. And now that the streaming has become so widespread, because even in the years after that, I was still using a camera and then filming to an SD card and uploading it. And so now that we've reached archaic. this point, the archaic, ancient dinosaur stuff, you know, and now we have phones that can Form that can film, well, film is probably not the right word. What word do you use now? Can record in 4K, in high definition, and live stream it to multiple platforms at once. You know, the truth is getting out there. And so, yeah, I think watching the way the different countries have reacted is really interesting. I know a lot of my friends who were in like Caribbean countries or South American countries, it was even more restricted than here, at least in Texas, where it was only certain genders could leave their house at certain times of certain days. And then it was also segregated into age groups. And so that was interesting, just noticing how things in different countries were unfolding. And in the end, the truth is getting out, you know, um, these, these places like the Netherlands and Sweden, where the masks are only mandated in close quarters, like public transportation, like a bus or subway, but everywhere else it's not, they are not experiencing massive die off from this, you know, coronavirus. And people are starting to question it. And now 
um, talking to, for example, there's a, a yoga studio here that I'm substitute teaching for, and the owner went through yoga teacher training with a yoga teacher in South Korea, and she had five students pass out in yoga class wearing a mask, so now they're just not teaching yoga because they had people fainting during class. And so, you know, this is starting to get out there. People are starting to realize that, okay, it's actually dangerous to ride a bicycle in the heat with a mask on, you know? It's actually dangerous to have children running in gym class on a track outside with a mask on. And so the information's getting out. They can't cover it up. They can't keep that a secret anymore because we've got yeah. Twitter and Instagram and, and Facebook and all these things. So that's what gives me hope, honestly, is information awareness. Um, we had this dream during the Fusion Center days of starting the PIAC, the People's Information Center, Analysis Center, where we would turn the cameras on them and compile information and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, I got pregnant and moved on with, with, my, with my life. Um, but I think essentially that is what YouTube and Twitter and all of these things have become. It's the People's Information Analysis Center. We can share information and create our own intelligence and it can reach everybody. And so that's why they're censoring people like you so hard because that information is getting out there and people are waking up in a way that I would not have imagined. So yes, 10 years ago, I saw the militarization coming down the pipes. I saw the medical crisis, you know, the, the FEMA centers that they were putting together. Um, for example, in Arkansas, we were driving through there in, July headed back to Texas and they announced, well, we've got facilities for people who have coronavirus that can't self quarantine. And I was like, oh, we got to get out of here, like right now. Like, I don't want to be in this state, you know? So, like, this stuff is happening. What I was not prepared for was the ease in which information could and would be shared and how quickly people would start waking up. And I think coronavirus is actually a very good thing for our movement because it's creating a mass awakening. Yeah, there's going to be a huge whiplash effect from this. And, and I, I want to point out the thing with two things in, with that that I remind my audience of as often as I can. One is that we who are already self-trained to question the mainstream narrative, uh, you know, like even myself, I was fooled by this for a while. For a while, I thought masks were good. I thought that maybe I... I might even have Corona and, you know, I needed to be careful about it. And I got over that pretty quickly because I, I kept reading and figuring it out. And most people, something that takes me a week to do or people like us a week to go through and process and realize and change our views on might take the average American who doesn't have this luxury, excuse me, three to six months or even more. And in the case of your dad, that it was 10 years before you saw that fundamental shift in his perspective. And, and it, it took me 10 years to go from I'm a libertarian to really understanding what that meant. And so, again, I, I have to underscore the, really one of the core messages uh, with Adam versus the man. I hope, I hope Kat's story you know, helps make my point, but when we're expecting people to change their perspectives, uh, em embrace ethics, embrace the truth. We have to be patient. We have to be persistent and we have to stay loving because if you fuck up any of those three things, it's just going to make it take longer. But Kat, um, before we get to our comments and see if anybody has any particular questions for you, tell us about how you got to the homestead.guru and making that the, and if I know it's not just that website, but I should say that genre of empowering people to live more free as opposed to, you know, building the new instead of fighting the old, you know, how did that become the focus of your activism? Well, after I went through my arrest and I was acquitted in New Hampshire, I realized I had a lot of healing to do. And I moved to a little tiny farmstead in Dripping Springs, Texas. And I did a work trade where I lived in a camper and I got my hands in the soil and I began working with the land. And this created an opportunity for me to start envisioning 
what I wanted for myself because I realized that if I continue down, I'm going to end up really incarcerated or injured or so sick that I wouldn't be able to function. I mean, I was depleted. I was very thin. I had acne all over my face. My stress level was absolutely insane. And early 2010, excuse me, early 2011, I got pregnant. And that was a wake up call for me. I watched The Business of Being Born, which is a documentary by Ricky Lake. And she talked about what happens in hospitals and how important it is to take back your right to birth freely as a woman. And so I got a midwife. I started seeing a natural path. I realized that I was so depleted that it was going to be difficult to maintain a healthy pregnancy. And I decided this is it. This is what I'm going to do with my life. And so my ex and I, we moved on to a three acre farm. We started a, a chicken farm. We had over a hundred chickens and we were documenting our experiences through this project called Sovereign Living. Now, initially Sovereign Living was my blog where I was talking about my pregnancy and uh, my midwife and recipes and gardening. And at that point in time, I was one of the early mom bloggers and we were getting over 3 million hits per month on my website. It was insane. And I was approached by a friend who has some really big homesteading pages on Facebook. And he said, hey, let's monetize this. You know, we'll, we'll post it on our Facebook page and you can put the ads on there and, and we'll monetize it. Well, because we were documenting the show through our nonprofit, the Sovereign Living Show, we we're doing the Saki Reality series. You can still find episode one on YouTube. It's, it's a really good series, very high quality. We were approached by multiple TV producers and we wanted to stay independent. And we fully produced four episodes. We have finished taping five and six, but you know, you'll hear later why we didn't finish. But um, I decided, okay, well, we have a business opportunity. We need to create a website that is not so closely associated with sovereign living because that kind of got gobbled up by the nonprofit. And so we created the homestead.guru. And the idea was that everybody can be their own guru. You are the guru. You actually have all of this knowledge. It's inside of your DNA, how to work with the land, how to live off of the land, how to grow food, how to birth babies, how to eat right, how to live in harmony with nature and other people. This exists within you. Now, it's been indoctrinated out of us. And so the idea wasn't that Catherine is the homestead guru. It was that we are all the homestead guru and we can all do this for ourselves. And so it really started as a solo blog project. It turned into, okay, we can write some viral posts. And then we started bringing on other team members. And at this point in time, we are running it as a collective, as a co-op. There's four of us. We profit share. I am not a good business person. I am a great researcher. I am a great communicator. I can talk all day long. I can do podcasts. I can do interviews. I can write articles. I'm not good at running a business. And I learned this the hard way. I actually almost failed the business. I mean, we have a very big email list, tens of thousands of, of email subscribers. We've got this big thing. And I just am not good at the technical side. I'm not good at the marketing side. I'm not good at keeping it running. And so this year, I brought on three of my good friends. And these are three women who are all walking the walk. Nobody is talking the talk without actually walking it, which is why I brought these women in to work with me. And so, for example, you know, Lily, she is basically running the infrastructure side of things that I'm not good at doing. She created the online store. She's also a content creator. Angel is our editor. You know, I am not a good editor because I'm dyslexic and I will put a typo <laughs> in a headline and I won't be able to read it. Like working for Anarchotoco, I wrote one blog post where I spelled it wrong in the SEO and I couldn't find the typo. I could not figure out what was wrong. And I wrote that word a hundred times a day when I was working for them, you know? And so, you know, having an editor there who could really have my back and make sure that we're putting out high caliber content. Because if you go look at some of the old stuff from five and a half years ago, whoa, I was publishing typos left and right. And then Elizabeth, she's that creative, you know, she does interior design. And so she's doing the Pinterest and the Instagram. And I feel like we've got this really great little group 
that's managing things. And we do all sorts of cool stuff. You know, we interview people who are living off the grid. We go visit gardens. We, we do video tours. We do articles. And we accept guest posts. So, you know, if, if you have a story that you want to share, you know, we will share that on there. We have almost 700 articles right now, which is so exciting. And they range basically decentralizing your life in any way, whether it's education, which can be homeschooling, unschooling, or going to an alternative school. Um, and I believe that education lasts a lifetime, right? This is not just for 18 and under or decentralizing your food supply, whether it's farmer's market, growing your own, decentralizing your energy sources, getting off the grid and um, decentralizing your income, decentralizing all these aspects of your life is how we began to create autonomy in our lives when we are no longer relying on the centralized grid. When that system can collapse and we can survive, that's when you know you are sovereign living. That is when you have your sovereignty, your autonomy in action. And so that, yes. that is where we are trying to go with this to give people the skills. Because right now it's all hell breaking loose right now. Like if you don't see the dollar collapsing right before our eyes, you're not looking. Why do you think they're bailing people out? They stopped bailing out corporations only. They're now bailing people out because they know that collapse is on its way. This is the longest standing fiat dollar in the history of the world. Here it is. We are about to witness a giant transfer of wealth. And we don't know exactly how it's going to look, but you need to be prepared. And this isn't alarmist. This is just practicality. Well, the, the, the giant transfer of wealth is what we've just seen over the yeah. last six months the, the, you look at the net worth of billionaires you look at the amount of liquidity added to the market you look at the consolidate and, and what they're doing they're not dumb they, they have the best mathematicians money can buy they're going to make this fiat currency last as long as they can but what it's really all about is accumulating the physical property that's been built up and developed by us plebes and the biggest part of that is the real estate crisis, or the, excuse me, the commercial real estate crisis first, where they've already bought up all these, uh, you know, shops where people couldn't pay the rent anymore, That's and right. the owners had to go, you know, bad, you know, had, had to default on their mortgages, and now it's in the residential market too. People are buying homes, but they're refinancing from the ground up. They're getting out of homes where they had equity, and those homes are being bought up by. Wall Street landlords, as, as the Wall Street Journal called them in the article we covered uh, uh, last week. But I want to go to the comments here, Catherine, and see you know, what questions people might have for you. But just to, to give people this, uh, the, the categories at the homestead.guru, do it yourself, environment, off the grid, grow your own, home remedies, recipes, rewild, RV living. Rewild, that's, that's, uh, that's about raising kids, right? Rewilding. No, not entirely. It's about rewilding and undomesticating yourself. So, uh. it's, it, you know, like, can you go into your backyard and identify a plant that can help you ease the symptoms caused by coronavirus? That's rewilding. All right. So, all right, so if we can get, and Jim, if you want to just start putting comments up here on screen or questions. Anything we've got for Kat, we'll just read these right off here. Psychic Taxi, that's our friend Ed from Phoenix. You know, Ed Vallejo. Hi, Tell Ed. Kat, Ed Vallejo in Arizona says hi if you get a chance. Yes, and Ed has been uh, not just a good friend for both of us, but uh, a longtime activist. I think, I think I know him from just about when I met you in the early days of the Ron Paul revolution coming out here to Phoenix to Ernie Hancock's crew. And he's someone also who's got uh, he's got his homestead in, uh, I think it's Navajo County, uh, as part of the Free County Project. They're doing his own his own version of this for sure. He writes again, you can let her know I'm off grid on five acres in northern Arizona. Uh, I can't access laptop. Uh, thanks, buddy, of course. Yes. So um, I'm, I'm actually really looking forward to getting out and seeing, seeing Ed's place and what, what he's got set up there as well. Uh, Philip A. Lamy, do you hope to live off the grid in Italy? And where in Italy do you plan to settle? Oh, I'm so excited to talk about that. Yes. So right now I live in the Bitcoin bus, which used to be the unschool bus. And I'm very familiar with being off grid and being mobile. 
Um, I'm in a cabin right now at an intentional community. And here at this intentional community, it's half off grid and half on grid. And so I'm, you know, we're testing it out for a couple months, getting to know the community, seeing if this is where we want to go. If we decide to stay here, we will probably look to build a house on the off grid side. I'm really interested in being fully off the grid. And there's well water here, which is great. My husband is from Northern Italy, sort of the Northwest side. And what I love about visiting there is that everybody is a backyard gardener. Everybody has food canned, stored away. They make their own wine. They've got uh, garlic and onion braids hanging in their pantries. Everybody is growing food. It's not a new novel thing or an old new novel thing like it is here in the United States. It's just their way of being. There's a lot of intentional communities out in Italy. In fact, I wanted last summer to go to an intentional community conference out there. I need to learn the language. So I want to start visiting those communities in the next probably, I'd say, seven years and start seeing where I'd like to put down roots. My ultimate goal is to have a decentralized geography with deep, stable roots. And I have to have roots in Texas because that's where the father of my children is from and lives. And I have to have roots in Missouri because that's where I'm from. And I want to have roots there. And someday, hopefully, I'll inherit our family farm there. And I, you know, want to have roots in Italy because that's where Paul lives from. And he's, he's an only child. And we really want to go help his parents, you know, toward the end of their life. So um, beyond that, I envision probably having three to four more places communities where I'm able to bond with and grow with and plant roots with people, but be able to move freely between them. So yes, very interested in being off grid and intentional community living in Italy as well. Awesome. What else do we have from the comments, Jim? Kimberly Wood, her IG page looks great. Followed. Awesome. Yes. I also follow the Homestead Grew. It's one of the ones I get alerts for on Instagram. Uh, healthy disrespect for authority. If you were converting from grid to solar, which solar appliance would you start with? I can't answer that. I don't know. I don't have solar. I've tried solar in the past. Um, I I just, I wish I could answer that question and I, I can't. Yeah, I mean, I, I would try, I guess, but, but solar appliance. I mean, do you mean piece of solar equipment or the... The type of panel running off of it, right? It's a bit. Yeah, I mean, like the thing is, the solar industry it changes so much every single year that to me it's like not worth researching until you're ready to buy because it's evolving so quickly yes. that stuff yes, gets that's... outdated really fast. Yes, but it, it, if I may, just you know, as, as as a quick primer on on solar, you you need four components to turn the sun into a power out outlet that you can plug something into you need your solar panel the solar panels go to a charge controller which moderates the electricity that comes from those panels in order to send it into your batteries component number three and then to convert that 12 volt to 110 to go to an outlet you need an inverter so you get those four things and those four things as kat said they're changing so rapidly in terms of like what's uh what's available and what's cost effective and what's appropriate for your situation. So the way you plan this generally is you backtrack and go, well, I want to run these appliances off my solar. And what, I'm going to come to a cool conclusion here because one of the things that I studied with Earthships was the simple survival system, the most lightweight way of living comfortably off grid. And you can, with a single solar panel, have it hooked up to a single battery and you can skip the charge controller with some of this equipment or have it so it charges minimally and it goes to an inverter and you have an outlet that's just enough to power, you know, to, to charge a laptop and a cell phone and a water pump just to run for your personal stuff, very low water pressure, and to maybe charge some uh, some batteries for some appliances or some, you know, battery powered lights or LEDs around, you know, a one room kind of, uh, you know, off grid cabin. It's not that complicated, but that's the process. And if you if you ever decide to jump into that, for the specifics, you got to look at what's current right now because it is it is always getting better and cheaper. And despite government's best efforts to serve the interests of <laughs> the fossil fuel and auto industries and everybody else related with their free road infrastructure and 
all the other kickbacks for corporatism, there's still a huge demand for solar that is really driving development in the industry to the point of like, I, I mean, even if you do the research six months later, you're going to have better deals. Significantly. It's always changing. And listen, a tried and true way to get off grid is go for propane appliances. Um, now, technically, there's a lot of controversy about propane because you're not technically off grid. You got to go get propane. You got to bring it in. Uh, but a lot of your appliances, refrigerators, you know, stoves and ovens, these things can run off of propane. Um, hot water heaters can be dual. You can have them run off electric or propane if you get those instant tankless hot water heaters. So there's a lot of options other than solar. For us, we've had an inverter that, that charges our batteries while driving the converted school bus. So it's actually the movement of the bus and we draw the power, I think from the alternator, it goes through the inverter, it charges the house batteries, which can give us about three days of power, not running the air conditioner, and then of course generators. But generators and propane, you're not technically off the grid, and ultimately, I would argue with solar panels, you aren't either, because you are dependent on external technology, whereas if you're building an earthship or some sort of home that can be cooled like if you're in a hot area like here in texas and, and you're built partially underground um if you can do passive solar heating um for winter you know then you can start really getting off these grids because you know it takes a lot of power to create solar panels and really they they turn into junk kind of quickly so it's just something to be aware of i'm not anti-solar panel um i'm definitely pro doing whatever you can to get off of the centralized electric grid and every step you take is a step in the right direction. But that path is gonna be different for everyone. Some people get off grid in an RV. Some people get off grid in a cabin. Some people get off grid in a, a giant ranch with a big house. And you know, so being off grid, it can be in a yurt, it can be in a, in a tent. There's so many different manifestations of being off grid that you know, Adam was talking about reverse engineering. You gotta even go further than the appliances. What type of house? are you gonna be in? Are you converting yeah. an existing suburban home? Probably want solar panels. You know, if you are building a cabin in the woods, you know, do, do you want to incorporate passive solar heating? Do you want to have your home recessed into the ground so that you don't have to deal with temperature fluctuations as much? I mean, this room, this cabin has bricks right on the floor and it stays so much cooler in the summer then the kitchen that's across the little courtyard right here, which is elevated off the ground and has air running underneath of it. So just a, a one foot difference makes a huge change in the temperatures of each room. Yeah, so it really comes down to a lot of personal preferences. And Kat, you made me think of this stunningly beautiful comparison, but it, homesteading is like painting uh, a, a landscape or, or a portrait and you can do whatever you want. You can make whatever uh, colors or techniques and, and we can, you know, the, 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 this is what I love about the concept of the guru is you're the guru. You develop the skills that you want to apply for how you want to live, not just by your values, but with your preferences. Now we had another question pop up about wind and I can tell you this real quick for, for someone who lives where we have great sun year round, wind is more trouble than it's worth. You're better off beefing up your battery capacity and not worrying about another device that is going to require maintenance and, and parts being replaced. That's the current criticism on wind. And wind is, uh, unless you live somewhere that's really shitty to live, sun's more consistent <laughs> than wind. So, you know, you got to do that balance for yourself. But if you're looking at wind as an alternative, that would be the the uh, you know the big question you have to answer. All right, Jim. Any other questions for Kat specifically here? Or really about homesteading in general? Because you know, the, I think my audience knows well enough about what we're doing here in Gardenia on on my ten acres in the mountains. All right, we have oh Ed weighs in again a psychic taxi. If you can get your air conditioner off grid, you will be able to run anything. Yeah, well, I, I mean, we've run air conditioners on generators, but the point here, I think, really in, in off-grid, the technique of painting that appeals the most to me is thermal mass and getting, you know, passive uh, solar for heat in the winter so that you have a, a thermal shell in a way that really doesn't require any air conditioning in the summer. And we have, we have one little building here that we did 
as a thermal mass warm up as our camp kitchen that is basically an above ground root cellar. And it's it's awesome when you when you uh, when it, when you're here and, and you it gets it got to 103 this year, 103 degrees. Yeah, of all the crazy things about 2020, heat records everywhere too. It was Ooh, uh, it was a hot one. That, what's that? It was a hot one. Yeah, you, well, you walk into this building, it feels like an air conditioned space, and I, I want people to. One of the things that I I want to preach and promote in in homesteading is you know the the earthship techniques uh, of thermal mass and passive solar as a way of designing more comfortable buildings that require a lot less heating and cooling uh, energy input or, or or zero if designed perfectly for their for their environment. So um, I, any other questions specifically for Kat? We, we're just a, about over time for her. I don't want to keep her too late. But uh, if there are any other burning questions from the audience, Jim, I'm sure she's happy to take them. Nothing popping up on screen here. All right, I guess we got to all the critical ones. They're probably debating solar versus wind in the comments right now and not even paying <laughs> attention to us. It's the kind of thing that sets off our live audience. But Kat, you know, if, if you would please you know, bring us home. Well, why, why is it so important to do this? What is your message to people who, you know, aren't, I guess, I, I mean, I hate to call them zombies, right? But, you know, in, in the way that we can all be zombies at different times, and, you know, I'm happy to admit all of my conditioning when I become aware of it, you know, it did lead me to enlist after all. But uh, <laughs> there, are, uh, there are, there are people who I think in their personal lifestyles are living by the expectations of others by the pressures of society. And really that's the most beautiful thing about what you do and the message that you promote is that it gives people that part of their humanity back to say, I am going to live for what makes my life better, not for what other people think is going to make my life better. What would you say to someone like that to motivate them to, to break out of the matrix, so to speak? I would say that you are the authority of your own life and that it is none of your business how someone else wants you to live. Your business is what you want and what is burning with a passion inside of you. And if you even have a little inkling that something isn't right with your lifestyle, I encourage you to lean into that. Journal, have conversations, do yoga, meditate, whatever it takes to start deconditioning so that you can hear your own voice again. Because we are inundated with messages all day, every day from people and institutions who want something from us, who want to exploit us, who want to use us, who want the fruits of our labor. You are entitled to the fruits of your labor because you are human and you are worthy, you are enough, you are valuable because you are human and you have the right to exist in this heaven on earth. We can create it. This is the Garden of Eden. It's here. It has been given to us. It is a beautiful gift. And when you start to break out of the matrix, and get outside and look around. You become so aware of the amazing gifts that we are given every single day in the form of beautiful views, beautiful sounds, swimming holes, food, medicine. It's all there being offered to us. And, you know, it's okay to get off the screen sometimes. I know you're hooked in, Adam. And I've mm -hmm. been hooked into, and it's okay to get off the screen sometime and watch the sunset and smoke your cigar and to relax. <laughs> All of these pressures and these expectations that you put on yourself are probably coming from some sort of external source. So get quiet, hear the voice that's coming from inside. And if you find that you have toxicity in your world, whether it's political toxicity or the way you make your money, your relationships at home, your relationship to yourself. I mean, here's the deal, Adam. I now realize in retrospect that all of my political activism, it was one big projection. It was, you're a tyrant. I want to be free. 
But as I started getting down to the least common denominator, I found that the tyrant was inside of me. And Mm. when I finally healed that tyrant and I gave her the love that she needed, all of a sudden I realized there were no chains binding me ever. Not once. I mean, I did get put in a cage twice, but I was still free, (laughs) you know, and I am free. I was free. There's nobody who can take that away from me or give it to me. I am inherently free because I am human, because I exist on this world. The trees are free. The birds are free. And we are free, too. You are free. So stop asking for freedom and start exerting it. Start showing the world your art. Because really, the way you live your life, that is your art. And if you can get out there and create a masterpiece like Adam was talking about, it is going to be so beautiful. And you are going to call in your tribe. You're going to call in your community. And quite frankly, I no longer want to be a part of the angry, vitriolic, confrontational, constantly in turmoil community. That's not my tribe. I'm Mm. calling in the lovers and the healers. And Adam, you were one of the first people who introduced me to the concepts of archetypes, which I see played out in yoga. I mean, downward dog, upward dog, you know, warrior pose. These are archetypes, right? It's in Mm -hmm. dream analysis, dream interpretation with Jungian dream analysis, which I'm a part of. It's in tarot cards. Like archetypes are ways of telling stories. They're in the fairy tales we heard as children. And you talked about this speech at Brave New Books in 20... 17. And it was Mm. the last speech ever given at Brave New Books before it was shut Mm -hmm. down. And you talked about people moving from the fighter to the, I think it was the healer, to Mm -hmm. the nurturer, to the builder and creator. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Warrior, healer, builder, lover. Yes, that's it. And I feel like our movement is coming to a place where I, for one, have gone through mass healing. And if you haven't had the opportunity to heal, reach out to the yogis in your life. Reach out to the wild medicine people in your life. Get out in nature. Find a therapist. Therapy helped me more than anything, honestly. And and yoga and therapy helped me the most. Find the healers that are there. Begin to work on your healing. And I'm seeing healing taking place. I'm seeing a a lot of the girls who are in the Ladies for Liberty Alliance, Lola, back in the day. They're doing yoga. They're having children. They're farming. They're gardening. They're finding this healing place. And now we get to move into building. And we can help these activists of today who are out there on the streets fighting for their cause. They're going to need healing. And as we build, we can give them a place to come heal. And as we call them in to help them heal, we heal ourselves, we elevate to the status of lover because we are bringing everyone together in this beautiful, beautiful healed space. And it's so important. And I'm so grateful for the work you're doing, Adam. It's really, really important. Well, likewise, Catherine, thank you. And I just want to point out, a uh, special comment from Mercedes in the Producers Club. She is my favorite person in the entire world right now. Just saying, <laughs> we build the Eden we want to live in. More of her. Catherine, thank you so much for your time today. And, and I hope everybody gets a chance to feel your energy and, and your wisdom through the homestead.guru. Thank you, Adam.